I'm ready. Greetings, parish orphans and retrogrades. Happy Wednesday, which they have called hump day. This is because it's the middle of the week, and this is the week leading to the hollow tide. I don't know why I keep mentioning that in opening our shows, except that I think it's neat. Today, what's also neat is I have with me my own editor from Sophia, who is a bona fide reactionary, and he is coming on to talk about the reactionaries response to those who naysay against the Crusades, the Inquisitions, maybe a little Columbus, and to plug his new book. His new book is called The Reactionary Mind, and the man himself is named Michael Warren Davis. Michael, thanks for coming on with me. It's good to be here, Tim. A friend and a colleague and an editor. Let me just say this, man. Parish Orphans and Retrogrades out there, you ought to know that the book that you read before you now, my book, The case for patriarchy was not bastardized. It was left with all of its reactionary splendor by its editor. And that's a very rare and beautiful thing in this world here below. Michael, you just, you left it extreme. You left it true. You left it reactionary. And and I thank you for that. And you're a good editor and we became friends. So today we're going to talk about your own new book out on Regnery. And and now I'm on, I'm on Regnery too. I'll, I'll make that announcement shortly. But uh, your book is called Reactionary Mind. It's really great. And I'd like to focus on the chapters that are most relevant to Catholics, like the Inquisition. And you know a great deal about the Crusades besides. So you start out in chapter four, and you entitle the chapter uh, something like why why reactionary, uh, why the Inquisition uh, is good. Why reactionaries defend the Inquisition. Do you want to give us... You can give us an overshot first, but um, after that, let's get right to the Inquisition. Yeah, sure. Well, I'm, first of all, the case for patriarchy was a fantastic book. It was great when it arrived on my desk. They picked me because I'm I'm very much of uh, the same opinion as you about all those sorts of things. It was terrific, and what was so good about it is that you know you're you're an awesome writer, but so much of the book is just it's it's information. It's just, here are the quotes from the Bible. Here are the quotes from the church fathers. Here are the quotes from the greatest philosophers from, you know, from ancient Greece onward. Um, it was, it's, it's inarguable. It's absolutely, you know, if you, if you want to argue against patriarchy, you have to argue against the whole history of Western civilization before 1960. Uh, so it's, it's a terrific book. I've given out so many copies. Everyone that I've given it to has loved it. Um, so if any of your readers are recalcitrant and haven't uh, and haven't bought it yet, they absolutely should. Um, my, it's yeah. a stunning pitch. That's a stunning pitch. I'd be blushing, except I'm I'm the one creature incapable of blushing. They, well, they you get you them. you gave you, you you paid me good money. I'm going to I'm going to deliver a good pitch. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> one reactionary uh, to another one retrograde <laughs> to a reactionary is a retrograde. Thank you for that. I really yeah, appreciate no, that. Sure. You did. You did a hell of a job editing it. Um by mainly leaving it alone. But let me tell, ask this, is, <laughs> yeah. a, is a retrograde a species of a reactionary? Tell us about that, because we're dressed kind of different, and people always talk about, for me, for you, you're dressed more like a reactionary, right? I'm dressed more like a, I, I was saying, we're like the archers, the retrogrades. We're ready to go do some, I got to keep my elbow space, man. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, I think that, uh, I think it, the difference, it's probably, it's probably like a painting. The more you explain it, the sort of, the more you're going to lose. So I think that you can, if, if, if someone, if someone, you know, had the, the, the photo that we have right here, you and me, and said, which one is the reactionary and which one is the retrograde? They would say, you're the retrograde and I'm the reactionary. And they would say, and then they would say, why? Say, I say, I don't know. It just is. It just is. It's a beautiful thing. Um, it's the, <laughs> yeah. the harmony in the universe. So yes. uh, I, we're, between we're, extreme right wingers, there's a harmony. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, no, no. That's uh, that, that's true. So I think that, I mean, if, if we're, we're, uh, if we're not brothers, we're at least cousins, we're brothers in arms to be sure. Um, there's uh there's, there's a, there's a, a, a familial resemblance um, between the retrograde and the reactionary. And we'll, we'll always be on the same side. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, um, man. You're, you're, I mean, your book is so, it's so the aesthetic is so spot on. We were talking about <laughs> book cover aesthetics yesterday yeah. with uh, Julia Maloney, who came on the show and her right. cover is so great over at Tan Books. Go buy that. Well, this new book, 
the reactionary mind, why conservative isn't enough. And you really back it up. I mean, I, I love the cover. I love everything about it. But with, with chapter four, you get right to kind of like you did as an editor. You just don't pull any punches. So why the Inquisition is good, why the why the reactionary would defend it or, or the Crusades. You know a lot about that, too. So can we can we leap off there and then go wherever the wind takes us? Yeah, sure. Well, um, the strategy, I guess, for the reactionary mind was this was the same as your book. It's just throw the facts out there and then. If someone wants to argue against against history, against reality, um, good luck to them. But it's it, but you know, I, 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 it's like again, it's like the case for patriarchy. If 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 you as the author sort of remove yourself as much as possible and just let the facts play themselves out, it's a much stronger book. And so um, the, the the Inquisition is is very sticky. Obviously, probably probably even stickier than the Crusades. Though I, I do I do definitely want to go into that. I didn't have time in the book. But maybe the next book. But um, the Inquisition. I think the 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 big question you have to ask with the Inquisition is why, and why why where, why did the Inquisition come about in the first place? And do you want to? I don't know. Do you know this? Do you want to take a stab at it? I'd, I'd rather I'd rather give you the time. I, I do know <laughs> why the Inquisition came out about in the first place. You know, with with the the Jews in Spain. Is that is that where we're going? Or well, that's I- uh, that that there is there is an aspect of that, but there's um. The, the, I, I think the the reason that it became so widespread throughout Europe um, is because is not because there was a, you know the heretics were threatening the country. It was because the country was threatening heretics. Um, there were these all these instances all over Europe where angry mobs were stoning people who were suspected of heresy to death. Um, the most important example is uh, in 1121, Peter Abelard, who you really don't like. <laughs> I, I, as uh, I remember from the case for patriarchy, he was he was a, an unfortunate human being. Proto nominalist, um, proto nominalist that he was. He was bastardo. He was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, but he was in his own time, he was accused of Sabellianism, which is a Trinitarian heresy. Um, and so he was he was, you know, it, he was, when he was walking through town, um, mobs would try to stone him to death. He was, you know, this and, and the church said, you know, the, well, the church and the state both said, you know, this is an issue for obviously for different reasons. The church, it was a threat to the, the peace and the civil realm for the state. And then for the church, it's not the right thing to do, right? To just yeah. to stone everyone you think is, you know, doesn't have a correct view of the Trinity. Now, um, 70, 75% of them is the golden mean. You're supposed to try to stone 75% of those. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was funny because, uh, because the, so the Inquisition came about as sort of a, uh, as an agreement between church and state. And the state says, you know, we need to, we obviously need to do something about these heretics. We can't. No, we can't uh, we can't let the people take justice into their own hands, but we're not theologians. We're, we're princes and dukes and, and whatnot. Uh, and so the, they went to the church and the church said, how about this? How about we'll try people for heresy? And if they're found guilty of heresy, we'll turn them over to you for punishment. Um, and so Jeez. what plays what plays out? Yeah. And so what plays out is uh, is that the you know, the uh, the the, her- the the Inquisition um finds innocent the vast majority of people that are brought to uh to its tribunals what a lot of people don't know but what every legal historian will tell you catholic or not is that the inquisition is the is really the first instance in western history of widespread presumption of innocence and the necessity for an overwhelming burden of proof um so you need to have uh you know it, it not only you need when, once you're accused you're brought before the tribunal you're presumed innocent until you're proven guilty and the proof and the presumption and the, the sorry the uh, the sentence of guilt has to be under the weight of a preponderance of evidence um and which is funny because even though the majority of people were actually probably found guilty that there was you know they could say he was published he was handing out these tracts he was seen by 30 people preaching on the street corner the Inquisition dismissed the huge majority of the cases that they uh, that they received, um, even though the people were technically guilty. And why would they do that? Um, well, first of all, because they didn't want to kill people. You know, Christians, for, you know, for the most part, don't want to, you know, don't want, they would rather they would rather love their fellow man than to kill him. Um, so they would find any excuse that they could to throw out a case. The most common ones were things like, you know, he might be a heretic. 
but he's kind of stupid. He's not making a very good case for his heresy. He's not really a threat to anyone's soul. He hasn't won any converts, so we're just going to let him go. Or he's very ugly. He's very uncharismatic. No one's going to believe this guy. They would throw these cases out. Sometimes the heretics would beg to be executed. They wanted to be martyred. The church knew that that's not a good idea. You Wait a minute. So to- you're telling me, you're telling me that my good, dear, beloved friends at National Catholic Reporter could not be tried as heretics because if you're ugly, stupid, and what was the other <laughs> one? If you're ugly and stupid, you can't be a heretic. Well, that that rules out like all the National Catholic Reporter uh, readers. Brutal. That is brutal. I'm not gonna, I can't respond to that. I'm, I'm a respectable Catholic editor. No, I mean, have you, look, <laughs> my two best friends in the world are Michael Sean Winters and Heidi Schlumpf. I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Heidi Schlumpf, even though we're best friends <laughs> at the National Catholic Reporter. Have you run that theory you just spun by me on, on her and, and him? I can. If they, they will. If they, if they, I don't know if they have a podcast. I avoid them like the plague. Um, but <laughs> yeah. if uh, <laughs> I'd be happy to go on and discuss this with them, we can prepare their defense. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's. I, I, so that, I think that's the that's the the main uh, the main what you call defense of the Inquisition. Um, but the, I mean, but then you sort of you dig deeper and uh, and the statistic I I which I did. I mean, I crunched the numbers by myself. There's you know original research in this book. And um, so, for instance, uh, they, we buried it in a footnote. I kind of wish we hadn't. But um, historic, this is a historic fact. The, uh, the, the Spanish Inquisition, which is generally believed to have been the most vicious wing of the Inquisition, the one that led to the most executions, yes. the Spanish Inquisition executed half as many people every year that, as the state of Texas does now. So you're not talking about like marching thousands of people at a time to, you know, to mass graves. It didn't happen. But um, I was like, again, I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm crestfallen. <laughs> I mean, that's so disappointing because Texas doesn't even execute that many people. This, that's so underwhelming, Michael. It is underwhelming. But this is, but where do these, I mean, we can, we'll talk about this, especially in the Crusades. This was more common with the Crusades. But you have these post-Enlightenment historians like Voltaire and Gibbons uh, Edward Gibbon, who are um, who who churn out these anti-Catholic tracts, these really really bad pathetic excuses for histories, um, where they 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 intentionally exaggerate these these numbers or don't give them at all and just and paint this picture of the Catholic Church just gre- you know, greedy for blood, um, going out and just maiming every everyone they can get that that can't you know they can't say the Our Father in Latin, and it right. just didn't happen. It didn't right. happen. Right. But the I think the before if you want to we can move on to the crusades or we can stay on this topic. But the, can I read uh, a section from your chapter here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Catholics and especially the English Catholics, this is on page 30, have always proclaimed the indissolubility of conscience. Cardinal Newman called it a magisterial dictate and the aboriginal vicar of Christ, which is a dope term. Hence his famous toast. If I'm obliged to bring religion into after dinner toasts, I shall drink to conscience first and to the Pope afterwards. Nevertheless, more, you're talking about Thomas More here, the the martyr of conscience. Uh, Nevertheless, More also wrote that the burning of heretics is lawful, necessary, and well done. A good and politic provision of the temporality. By temporality, he meant government. And that was the crux of his argument. Now, I want to... point listeners and and would-be readers to the page before this, when you open by showing that um, the USCCB in 2018 named Sir Thomas More, along with John Fisher, as patron saints for their religious freedom week. Do they know how based Thomas More was? I mean, you write this, More was without a doubt one of history's most interesting men, England's greatest humanist. He was celebrated as a politician, author, lawyer, and scholar. He was also a pioneer of investment banking and a gifted astronomer. All in all, he's a fine patron for any endeavor. You write, I couldn't help but chuckle, however, at the bishop's choice because Moore is also a staunch defender of the Inquisition. Mm -hmm. Do they know this? USCCB, along with my my two BFFs, uh, Michael Sean Winters and Miss Schlump. Brutal. um, (laughs) Do they know it at all? The USCCB or what? No, no, there's no way. I, I really don't think that anyone knows these things. Again, they're out there for anyone that wants to read about it. If you do a little bit of digging, 
but most people get their history either from Man for All Seasons, which is a good movie, which I say in the book. I love that movie. Yeah. Um, they either get it from the Man for All Seasons or they get it from the two, the HBOs, the Tudors or Wolf Hall. Um, it's so, oh, one of your favorite movies. And I can cite that. You know how it I is. Know. It's because <laughs> you read First the book. First line, page 30. A Man for All Seasons is one of my favorite movies. End quote, Michael Warren Davis. Fantastic movie. Great soundtrack. Um, <laughs> no, it does. It, it is, is. It is a good movie, but it's it's quite. And, and this is the thing, you know, the, the, the question that every historian of Thomas More has asked is, was he the first Renaissance man or the last medieval man? And at some point, it doesn't really matter. But he was basically he was both. He was a great humanist in the sense that he believed in liberal learning and the cultivation of a, of, a, of a liberal education. All true. He was also a staunch believer in the burning of heretics. And, uh, and again, he's, you know, he's not speaking as a theologian. He wasn't a theologian. He was speaking as Chancellor of England. He was speaking as the, the, the after King Henry, um, the most important political figure, the most powerful political figure in the Kingdom of England. And if I can, I just want to, uh, I want to read a little bit more of what he wrote about it because uh, because it, it gives his it gives his explanation. So um, so Thomas More and the same uh, I forget the same writing where uh, he's defending the you know he, where he says that burning of heretics is lawful, necessary, and well done, a good and politic provision of the temporality. Uh, he says, and surely the princes um, be bounden that they shall not suffer the people by infidels to be invaded. So be they as deeply bounden that they shall not suffer their people to be seduced and corrupted by heretics since the peril shall in short oh sorry since the peril shall in short while grow to as great both with men's souls withdrawn from god and their goods lost and their bodies destroyed by common sedition insurrection and open war within the bowels of their own land which uh, <laughs> is easier to read in your head than on paper but basically what he's saying is if you imagine what happens if you know when Spain is invaded by Muslims, um, not only is the initial invasion brutal, um, but the lingering division between Christians, Jews, and Muslims in Spain causes no end of civil strife. He's saying the same thing. Heretics are doing the same thing. If you have a bunch of different religions uh, competing for dominance in a country, uh, you're going to have violent civil unrest, and that's exactly what happens all over Europe. Um, and then, I, as I explained at the end of the chapter. The wars of religion are only, you know, not only in England, you know, Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, uh, well, Edward, and then Elizabeth, and then Mary. Um, in France, you know, you have Paris as well, worth the mass, the, all that stuff, the, the, the Guises. Uh, and then in Germany as well, the, you know, the, 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 the Reformation leads to divisions in German society that continue to this day. The only way that that, that is solved is that the, you have the Enlightenment come out um, and basically say we're going to purge religion from public life. It's too, right. it's too, vi it's too dangerous. It's too, we, you know, we can't trust people to have these deep felt religious convictions. And so, of course, after that, you have people like Hitler and Stalin and Mao trying to, pur you know, committing atrocities in part, trying to purge society of religion. And this is continuing on to the present day. And so, with as NCR, I say, with National Catholic Reporter, <laughs> they, they're trying to purge society of Catholicism by their odious. It, yes, and also rooting for the. It, I, I don't know if you remember this, but when uh, when Cardinal Pell was first convicted, they published an editorial of, uh, naming me and some other people who stood up for Cardinal Pell, saying, "You know, I can't believe that you know people like Michael Warren Davis would would cast doubt on the on the integrity of the Australian legal system." It's like, <laughs> who the hell are you? Are you are you the, these great experts in Australia in the Australian legal system? Unbelievable! Yeah. It's just on principle taking sides against the church whenever they can there's right. no other explanation for it they have no idea what australia's legal system is like yeah. i happen to because i lived there for many years i happen Did to you? know that it's incredibly corrupt we're seeing that now with the lock with the lockdowns australia has a terrible legal system it's why i don't live there anymore it's it's a it's a, it's a terrifying place to live is but it? uh but of course but of course the the reporter is going to take sides with the government against the church yeah, no, yeah, yeah, beautiful. Well, I mean, it, the whole country, yeah, the whole continent, I can say, mm -hmm. was founded by uh, ex ex cons, right? Is that really true about Australia? That, that's not what's scary. It's not the ex cons that are scary. It's the, 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 a lot. Most of Australia is descended from ex cons. A lot of them are also descended from the guards, 
And so you have this mentality, there's guards and there's prisoners and the government can't trust the people. That's, that's the way that it's always been in Australia. The government has always treated the population like prisoners who can't be trusted with their own security or with the security of their fellow citizens. It's always been that way. I don't, I don't trust them. I don't trust No, them. don't. And I, I, love, I love the country of Australia. I love the Australian yeah. people. Again, I live there. I have some of my, you know, my groomsmen at my wedding came over from Australia. I love the Australians. Um, yeah. But their, their political system is terrifying. And yeah. there's no, it doesn't, I'm, I'm surprised that they've vindicated Cardinal Pell at the end. I fully expected him to rot in jail. Yeah, yeah. That's what I, that's what I thought, too. I was never sure defending a churchman on pedophile, pederasty charges these days is a bit like, you know, tempting fate but but i you know i was hoping the whole time and of course i yeah i i love i love matt frad good dude he he's uh he's a product of australia but okay can i ask you something before we move on to the crusades and i'm gonna i'm gonna give a couple little plugs uh before we do that but real quick you have a chapter on savonarola now he gets counted among the preformers that you know like along with uh Wyclef and Hoos, is he, is he, does he belong among the preformers? Cause there's nothing less based than being one of the preformers, but Savonarola <laughs> was pretty dope. He's in, he made it into Raphael's uh, 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 disputation of the sacrament. And that I have that a giant version of that painting up in my dining room. So mm. it, I mean, that's based is tell us about Savonarola really quickly. Sure. No, Savonarola is every every uh, serious Protestant historian will say that Savonarola not only never broke from Catholic orthodoxy, um, but was in but was in every instance motivated by Catholic orthodoxy. Was in many instances responding to attacks on church tradition that were being committed by the Medici, for instance, the Medici who liked to tinker with the liturgy. To make it more popular, he was Savonarola was a liturgical traditionalist. People don't realize that he was a Dominican, so he liked he liked simple liturgy, but he hated innovation in liturgy. That was one of the first things that set him off against against the Medici family was that they were trying to set the mass to popular chants. That's how he. That was the one of the first indications he had that uh, that the Medici family was you know was impossibly corrupt. We could certainly use a Savonarola now. The yeah. same thing is happening. We, we, we today, you, uh, you and I are both traditionally minded um, when it comes to the liturgy, and, and we know that 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 reckless embrace of of liturgy of liturgical modernism is is damaging to the church and to the spirituality of the people. Savonarola was on our side with that. So, um, do you want more? <laughs> no, that's really good. I I knew that Raphael wouldn't be wrong. He he knows his history before he gets to his painting. And I knew, I knew he, I always intuited that he doesn't belong up there with Wyclef and Hoos and the other so-called preformers. So I just, well, Saint, I'm glad no, you straightened that out. This Saint book Phil, is so Saint, good. Can I just, <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead, Michael. No, no, just real quick. I mean, um, Savonarola's biggest admirer uh, in, in, his, in history post, uh, post-Renaissance is St. Philip Neri. St. Philip Neri had a picture of Savonarola in his, in his bedroom his whole life. He loved, and, and, and he passed that love on to, to John Henry Newman. John Henry Newman was a great admirer. I knew um, that part. You yeah. can go down, I mean, you can go down the list. Um, Orestes Brownson, the first Catholic intellectual in American history, um, problematic, but was a huge admirer of Savannah Roba, wrote very glowingly. So it, it, the list goes on and on. Um, and so the, the idea that he is a proto-Protestant or whatever is, um, is, is disingenuous. Yeah, for sure. I'm glad you cleared that up. Let me just read um, part of your table of contents. I think people really will see just hearing the content, why they need to go buy this book, The Reactionary Mind. Half the time, my autofocus messes it up when I hold something up, but I don't think it did today. Uh, Chapter one, The Reactionary's Dreams of Heaven. Chapter two, The Reactionary's Code, Loyal and Joyful. This this kind of reminds me of, um, in a different way, of the beginning of of my second book, uh, Rules for Retrogrades. Uh, Chapter three, why the reactionary has a sneaking suspicion for Savonarola. Chapter four, why reactionaries defend the Inquisition. So good. Chapter five, why reactionaries don't follow the science. Hmm. Very good. Chapter six, why reactionaries don't worship reason. Really? Like a light in a lamp? Uh, no, cha- chapter seven, why a reactionary would like to abolish politics. Eight, reactionary working man 
paging Ned Ludd. I like that chapter title. Nine, the reactionary American. Ten, against progress. And that's just part one. Uh, part one is titled That Was Then. Part two is This Is Now, uh, an, an ode to uh, Leo Strauss, I guess. But it's just it's just good stuff. I haven't made it all the way through here. But it's just you're a good writer. It's it's rich. And we're going to get on to the Crusades, which I guess you don't mention in your That Was Then section, but you are knowledgeable there too. And you can vindicate the Crusades in the same way that you vindicate the Inquisition. First, I'd like to remind people to like, subscribe this channel and hit the bell, the notification bell that allow you allows you to know when a video is starting. I, I don't bother you guys enough about it. And I, I've pledged part of my New Year's resolution of 22 will be to be more bothersome um, because it, it's, it's important and everyone else does it. When I watch these NBA history videos or other content on YouTube, they do it a lot more than me. So like, subscribe, hit the bell, leave a comment. I like cookies is sufficient because it still gets in the algorithm of, of YT. Also, if you want to support this show most directly, patreon.com, Timothy J. Gordon. Hail my loyal patrons. I really appreciate you guys. Also in 2022, the benefits for patrons will be enhanced. And they're already quite good, but they're going to be enhanced. That's another New Year's pledge. Uh, I'm, I'm two months early on that, but you can take that to the bank. A less direct way of supporting the program is to buy my new book. I don't have it here now, actually. Uh, the Case for Patriarchy, which was edited by the gentleman who's sitting across from me. And finally, the main endorsement I do on this show is Real Estate for Life. Go to realestateforlife.org. They will help you get from a blue state to a red state. I guess they'll help you if you want to move from a red state to another red state or within one red state. But mainly... I support people getting out of your blue state into a red state, just like I did from California to Mississippi. It's a big hassle, but they'll make it smaller. Go to realestateforlife.org. Okay, Michael. So let's do the Crusades next. Why are they super, super good? Well, this is, uh, I guess I probably learned about the Crusades in public school. Um, and I realized going back as a Catholic and reading about the Crusades, the thing that they never give you are the dates. And if you know all the dates for the Inquisition, for the, uh, the Crusades, yeah. you, history plays out very differently. So we know that Pope Urban launched the Crusades in 1095 with a speech. What people don't realize is that for 300 years already, you have had Muslims trying to conquer Europe and in many cases succeeding. Before the first Inquisition, you have Charles Martel prevent, try, fighting the Muslims that are trying to, that have already overrun Spain and are trying to push their way up to France. You have Charlemagne trying to reconquer Europe, trying to drive the Muslims out. Before all, never, at no point here have, the, have Christians, you know, have, has all of Christian Europe come together to fight the Muslims, even in a defensive war. Um, this, this hasn't happened yet. The only to, even when the Holy Land is overrun by Muslims, um, and they were not, they weren't Arabs, they were, they were Tur Turks, right? Um, even when, even when the Holy Land is overrun by Muslims, invaded by Muslims, there is no crusade. It's only when this huge Turkish army gets ready to bring down the gates of Constantinople. And the, the Byzantine emperor appeals to the Latin kingdoms um, yeah. for help. Does Pope Urban launch a crusade? Um, it is a pure, it, it begins as a purely defensive war. It is always a purely defensive war because uh, this is another question you don't, you, you, no one ever asks. Where did the Muslims in the Holy Land come from? If you ask a public school history teacher that, they'll, they'll just give you a blank look. Where did they come from? Did they just sort of did they did they move there very peacefully? Did they did they hire a real estate agent? Did they hire a U-Haul and and you know buy property in Jerusalem and move? They they invaded. Of course, we know that. It's 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 intuitive. And so where did the you know who was there before? Who was in the whole who was in Jerusalem? Who was in Palestine before the Muslims invaded? Jews mostly, Jews and Greek Christians. Um, so the so the so the we talk about the sort of the Crusader kingdoms that 
occupied Jerusalem, which is true. They did. There were, there were crusader kingdoms. But those crusader kingdoms were taking the Holy Land back from Muslim invaders. And the original inhabitants were Jews and Christians. Um, yeah, and it, would, can I jump in yes, here? Yeah, yeah. With, like 400 years before, the moment that uh, Islam, because I know more about this than the Inquisition, the moment within the same century that Islam crept on all fours out of the Arabian deserts, it was immediately trying to take everything over. Mm -hmm. Muhammad according to Robert Spencer, fought in 79 battles in his life. He's a warlord, not, not, a, not a holy man, but a warlord. And 78 of 79 were offensive. All of this violence began at the so-called flight, the Hijra, from Mecca to Medina, where basically in Mecca, Muhammad's hometown, with his uncle Ali, you know, the two halves of the name of Muhammad Ali, uh, they were run out of town, basically on a rail. I'm not sure if they had rails, but they were run out. And by the time they got to the next town, Medina, for some reason, I, I don't know, maybe you know this, they were hailed in a welcoming way. And, and they were surprised and everyone was surprised. So they're big rock stars in Medina. They'd been run out of Mecca. And only when they were popular did the Quranic teachings in the later Quran start changing and say, go ahead and, and convert the infidel at the point of a sword. That's when, and, and of course, unfortunate for all the world, the Quran functions on an interpretive principle of abrogation, meaning the later passages in the Quran trump the earlier, which sucks for all of us and all of our buildings and everything that's been uh, bombed or destroyed, according to this Quranic principle of abrogation, because the later trumps the earlier. But within 70 years, they already tried to take over Constantinople. It was the first real extrinsic challenge for the Eastern Church. You know, the Western Church was always dealing with Van, uh, Visigoths, Vandals, Huns, barbarians from the north, but you know, in Rome. But in Constantinople, within, within 100 years of Islam crawling on all fours out of the Arabian deserts, it was trying to take over Constantinople. And they nearly got it, I think, in the year 700. But they were eventually repelled by the Carolingians, um, and they would be repelled for the next several years, but they got it eventually, Constantinople, and, uh, and they got Spain too, like you're saying. So you can, sorry, I just wanted to throw, throw that out there, Michael. No, that's absolutely true. Um, no, that's absolutely true. And it's, if it matters, it's not even just Christians. You know, when the, when the, for, for a very long time, you're right, the, 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 the Persians and the Byzantines were never an existential threat to each other. On principle, they neither actually wanted to wipe out the other because it would have been too tedious to, for one to rule the other. Um, but all of a sudden, you know, per, we, we know what happens, you know, when the Muslims sweep up and, uh, and, and attack Asia Minor and Persia. Persia's, Persia becomes a Muslim country. That's why Iran is Muslim now. Um, so at the same time that the, that the Muslim armies are trying to conquer Byzantium, and convert them to Christianity from Christianity to Islam. They're doing the same thing in Persia, trying to convert them from Zoroastrianism to, to, to Islam. It's not just a Christian versus Muslims thing. It's a Muslims versus everyone else thing. They yeah. were, they were trying to, and this was, and, and you're right there. And there, there are passages in the Quran that say that, you know, you must not force anyone to convert. And so the, the Muslim warlord said, all right, we won't force you to convert, but we will kill you if you don't, or we will enslave you if you don't. Right. You know, we can't, we can't make you convert, but we can, we can kill you if you decide to persist in your dimitude. Um, it's just exactly what happened. It's what happened at every turn. But I, yeah, I think that uh, the, but the, again, the important thing to remember is that the, um, the Holy Land was populated mostly by Christians and Jews. And the people that were invading were not even Arabs. They were Turks. They were the same army that was eventually going to wipe out Byzantium and that was going to take over, the, that was going to destroy the Persian Empire, that was going to eradicate Zoroastrianism. Um, it's, it, you know, they, are, they really, are, and even back then, even back then, these first forays into Europe, they're genociding Armenians. The Turks, the, 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 we talk about the modern Ottoman genocide of Armenia, um, which, is, which is horrific. But when the Turks first invade um, Armenia, they round up all the Christian noblemen, put them in a church, lock the doors and light the church on fire. 
this is this is before you know this is before the Ottoman Empire is is even a, you know a twinkle in the Sultan's eye. It do, it doesn't exist yet. Um, this is this this kind of this barbarity against Christians in Christian indigenous Christian countries. Armenia is the first country to convert to Christianity. You know, um, the, this this violence against Christians, this in, in invading Christian countries and trying to eradicate the Christian population. This happens as soon as as you say Islam crawls all out of the desert on all fours it's the it's the first imperative wow wow yeah man i mean it's it's weird that islam presented the eastern church before they're the eastern orthodox you know in 1054 they're just the eastern church you know the second c of the of the of the one catholic church you know before they split now there was a long tension before the divorce as uh Unfortunately, there always is about a thousand year tension between Rome and Constantinople. But the first real extrinsic challenge, I, I find it important to point out in church history classes for the Eastern Church, the Greek Church, the Constantinopolian see, was the Muslims. And like, again, I, I don't know how to say it much more clearly, but the Muslims were problematic for the Eastern part of the empire, the Eastern Empire specifically, from the moment that um, Muhammad and Ali went to Medina. And it, it is really funny when you consider that, you know, those early Quranic passages do admonish peace. That's because they weren't well liked in Mecca. Once they get a little bit powerful, office will show a man, as, as Aristotle quotes an old philosopher called bias, office will show a man, it will show someone's meddle or the character, Muhammad, once he gets a little power, becomes an insane warlord and tries to take everything over. I want everyone to consider then the first surah of the Quran, even, even the more, more peaceful version of the Quran. That first surah, uh, it, it has eight verses, and they are what's prayed on five times a day by Muslims. The seventh verse and the eighth verse, respectively, are basically prayers for God to visit his vengeance upon Christians and Jews, respectively. So, I mean, the effect that this has on a mind to, to pray it five times a day, like praying five mini rosaries a day where you're not asking for peace or love, agape, charity, none of that. It's literally asking for the vengeance of God. And like you say, Michael, uh, a tax was laying on the people of the book, Christians and Jews, who, um, if you fail to pay this tax, it's called the jizya, then you would be killed. It's like mob protection money. So we've been lied to about the Crusades, uh, just like we've been lied to about the Inquisition. Why? Why have we been so lied to about the Crusades? Again, well, that, that goes back to um, largely Voltaire and Gibbon and the Enlightenment historians who were... Um, in their own strange way, Islamophiles. They were also the ones that that propagated the myth that the the Christian West was barbaric, right? And then the Islamic countries were enlightened, and uh, and that they had you know they had all these accomplishments in science. Of course, the accomplishments in science that come out of the Muslim world at that time are mostly being you know achieved by the lingering populations of of Greek Christians and Jews and the people that are studying the Muslims that are studying under them. It's, it's part of the Greek tradition. It's not part of the Islamic tradition. You right. know, if I, if I, if I kidnap William Shakespeare and I publish his, his, uh, his, his plays under my own name, that doesn't make me the greatest playwright in history. You know, this, this, this golden age of Islamic civilization is just a continuation of Greek civilization by another means. That's hardly important, I guess. Um, but the, the, what about the, this is one thing I'm going to I'm going to step out of character for a second and I'm going to, to to play the other side. What about the important contribution? People are expecting a joke here. But what about the important <laughs> contribution to philosophy? I, I'd consider this a most contribution, most important contribution by the Arab philosophers in preserving the text, the lost texts of Aristotle, particularly in Segovia, Spain and the other dig sites in Spain where Aristotle had been lost for the better part of the first Christian millennium. The Arabs had taken him and gave us to Thomas two very, very important interpreters. One he simply calls the interpreter, Averroes and Avicenna. Now, so I can answer my own question to some extent, but I'd like you to take a crack at it. 
Averroes and Avicenna weren't good Muslims, right? I mean, Averroes was eventually basically run out of the faith. He sided more with Aristotle than Islam, but they were important influences on Thomas and, and at least nominally Muslim. Yep, I can't argue with that. I think you hit the nail on the head. They were they were great philosophers because they weren't very good Muslims. You can't you can't really do the two. And I don't say that as you know a judgmental. Uh, I I actually have a I'm <laughs> I'm not I'm not sympathetic to nominalism, but I I I I kind of uh, I have a little more tolerance for nominalists. I think that their their emphasis on sort of God's will is something that you know as a, as a natural someone naturally inclined towards Thomism that I, I kind of need to remind myself that it's not it's not all about what I can do with my with my brain box right it's 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 also some things are beyond me um, so I, I I do enjoy Abelard a little bit more I learn a little bit from him and uh, and then I also really you know enjoy reading philosophers like al-ghazali who you know is is probably the most important muslim philosopher for yeah. islamic civilization he is like the thinker that yeah. has shaped their intellectual tradition and he yeah. is anti-philosophy he the says philosophy is because islam is pure nominalism it is pure whatever allah says is good is good he can change his mind and it's still good because we we are too small to comprehend these categories good and evil Good is what Allah likes, bad Al-Ghazali's philosophy. So you can't be a philosopher and a good Muslim because a, a good Muslim is a nominal, a pure nominalist. And nominalism totally, you know, it, 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 it totally um, it, it, it excludes the possibility of using human reason towards any productive end besides, you know, if uh, when it gets cold, you're probably going to want to store grain. Right. That's that's that is the total extent of what human reason is good for Practical in a nominalist reason. system. Right. Yeah, yeah. No speculative reason. Exactly. Yeah, also, nominalists, um, particularly in the late medieval period, almost always tended to be voluntarists. And remember, this is central to Islam. And sometimes it feels like Protestantism. Mm -hmm. They are vo voluntarists. God's will is prior to his intellect, which is why good is by definition for Islam whatever God says do, bad is for Islam, whatever God says don't do. Violence can be made good because God's intellect is not prior to his will. His will is, he can change. Um, and therefore his diktats can change. For us, and, and in reality, we know that God's intellect is prior to his will. Um, and this is why thing, things, truth, as it were, is unchanging. But um, but you know, nominalism and voluntarism are the worldviews that are kind of coupled that follow around Islam, they follow around Protestantism in a Christian way, uh, which is why it isn't violent. But it's a similar thing. They 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 dictate that ultimately God's will is first. It's inscrutable, unlike God's intellect is partly scrutable, and therefore these changes can happen. A man can temporarily divorce his wife and then re undivorce him, her and uh, things like that. So you, you, the religion reflects the view of the essence of the creator. And in the case of Islam, which means submission or something like that, it's all about submitting to the ephemeral, mercurial, ever-changing flights of fancy of this will God, this voluntary God. And um, his name is a lot. Can I can I loop back to the uh, the Inquisition real quick because something that you said sparked some, uh, a memory. But uh, it's I think that the a lot of times people conflate the uh, the Inquisition with something like the Salem witch trials. And yeah. uh, when talking about Germany, reminded me that the, um, the the actually the the most religious violence of that type committed in Europe was committed in Germany by Protestants. Burning witches was not was not really heard of in Catholic Europe for the very simple reason that you wouldn't be able to convict them. There wasn't proof. And so all of these hokey, you know, tests that you get out of places like Salem, you know, if she throw her in the water, tie her up and throw her in the water, if she floats, she's a witch, if she drowns, she's innocent. That is we that's lunatic to us. And but the you know, the the when when someone like Monty Python imposes that on the on the middle ages it would never have happened because again the right. the, the burden of proof um, the presumption of innocence are the operative principles of the inquisition when you get rid of catholicism you get rid of those principles right and they, they even come from um before 
technically, if we're doing an etiology, they really are codified for the first time in Magna Carta. And I'd say the Magna Carta's principles uh, emerge uh, in the Inquisition. I'm, gonna, I'm looking forward to reading your chapter again on the Inquisition and redoing it. But I mean, the Magna Carta is a Catholic document, right? Signed by a bunch of bishops. Of and all of these, right? You just don't get these uh, Monty Python absurdly anti-intellectual legal <laughs> leitmotifs from uh, from the Catholic world. You know why? Because the Catholic world is for smarty pantses and, <laughs> and, uh, and to put it in a technical way. And we don't get this kind of nonsense bluster that we're later embarrassed by. This, this happens in voluntarist nominalist traditions like Islam or sorry, Protestants within Protestantism, mm -hmm. which is what you're, you're pointing out. So that meant great, great stuff. This all shows why it's so important to understand the history, yes. the history, the history, the history. Your book is so, so, so exciting, Michael, because I love the moment where a, where a conservative can say, look, conservatism is fake and gay. It's tepid. I want to <laughs> oh, yeah. go reactionary. I want to go retrograde. They both begin with RE. And I think there's something to this. We need to go to the far right, start going on offense, quit playing defense the way these tepid conservatives do. And let's get down to business. We need to retake the history and the institutions or make, or, 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 you know, uh, proverbially burn it and salt the earth and rebuild our own. This is my exciting book that will also be uh, a pub publication mate with yours uh, on Regnery coming out next year. I'll, it's it's going to be all about restoring, particularly the institution about college. And uh, I'm going to announce that with my friend, uh, Dr. Michael Robillard in a few short days. But um, for now, Everyone go buy The Reactionary Mind, Why Conservative Isn't Enough by Mr. Michael Warren Davis, editor and writer extraordinaire. Michael, any parting shots? We got to get out of here. No, no, Tim. But again, I just, uh, I'm so glad that you're writing for Sophia. I'm so glad that you're writing for Regnery. Um, and part of, <laughs> we, uh, I think our, my editor discovered you when he was doing market research for The Reactionary Mind. And he said, the only thing about this book, Rules for Retrogrades, is that going to be, uh, is that going to make the market a little too tight? I said, no, Tim and I are on the same wavelength. He's a great, he's a great writer, but, uh, but we're, but we're going to, we're going to, it's going to be, we're going to flank. It's going to be a one-two punch. Thank you for sharing that. Can I share something insane about my relationship with Harry, who I had on the show? I don't know if you know, he came on the show. Oh, about no, a month I didn't go. I got to look that up. No, no, this is nuts, Michael. Okay. So me and you were talking about your book two or three months ago. And I was like, this is so exciting. And you're like, yeah, I'm on Regnery. And I was like, that's like the golden goose, man. That's the big dream for it. Cause I wanted to be on Regnery for, for almost 20 years. And um, I mean, I, I love my two publishers, Tan and Sophia. They're amazing. The, the, the top word in Catholic publishing, but, but Regnery is just, it's, it's all kinds of Catholics that run the company, but it's, it's conservatism writ large. So I was like, that's awesome, man. And you're like, yeah, I have to tell you about Harry, um, Harry is basically vice president. He's acquisitions editor. He does all these things. He had an important role in the politically incorrect guidebooks on Regnery, which are hugely important to me. And I always wanted to write one starting 15 years ago. Well, you're like, yeah, Harry knew Tim. You're telling me this on the phone. Harry knew about rules for retrogrades, the book, and he knows of you. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And I was like, next time you talk to him, you know, kick some shouts out to him, throw some love and let's see what happens. So you're like, yeah, I will do it. We got off the phone and then like 18 hours later, less than a 24 hour day later in the early morning, who, uh, I don't think he called me, he emailed me, who emails me except Harry from Regnery. And uh, he's like, hey, can you talk later today? We're interested in working with you. And I was like, that's amazing. And I was like, thank you. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> and then I talked to him and he was, I was like, so you spoke to, to Michael Warren Davis about me. And he was like, no, no. He's like, I haven't talked to Michael in six months. Like, like, uh, like the bartender tells Frodo, like, no, I haven't seen Gandalf in, you know, six months. And I was like, what the heck? So it was a pure coincidence. He had been selling his house. He just moved to Mississippi. And I guess he sold his house to a Catholic. And the Catholic was like, oh, you're moving to Mississippi like, like Tim Gordon. And, and he was like, oh, I need to get in touch with Tim Gordon. So it was just this provident, beautiful uh, alignment of the stars. Yeah. 
And um, what I'm really saying is I don't owe you thanks because Harry contacted nope. me on his own. So I would have, this is, it's perfect for me because I, I would have introduced you, but I felt bad about it because obviously I work for Sophia. So the connection was made and I didn't sell out my company at the same time. So it, it worked out best for everyone. And you owe me nothing. You owe yeah. me nothing. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I was just, <laughs> I was just kidding. I, I, you know, you, you, you and Sophia are, uh, the best publisher a boy could wish for, uh, a small boy could wish for, for his uh, book when he's a grown up man of a writer. But uh, it was just really weird because I was like 99.99% certain, given it was 18 hours later when you're like, yeah, I'll, I'll. <laughs> you're like, I mean, you probably felt some conflict of interest because you work for Sophia. Yeah. But this, this is a secular topic anyway. Sophia wouldn't have had interest in it. Um, sure, yeah. Yeah, but but you didn't do it. I don't want to get you in trouble with it. It was just really oh, odd time. <laughs> yeah, it it's amazing. So odd. And I know that they're they're really excited. And I I again I know that they read rules for retrogrades. And uh, I I I did. I've I've liked every book of yours that I've read. But I, I this would be a good topic for another show. I'm not inviting myself back. But um, in the process of researching this book, I came around to your thesis in uh, Catholic Republic. And it was, again, like I'd read it, I kind of dismissed it. Um, I put it on the shelf. And then while I was looking up the Middle Ages and Christian statecraft, and then also the early founding documents, I was like, wow, Tim was actually right about pretty much everything that he said in that book. Um, let's let's I, do I a had, show on that soon. I had been an back. integralist. I am not an integralist anymore. Um, and that I would I would love to talk to you about, about why. And not, and not because I'm trying to screw it myself, but because I really am concerned about protecting this republic in a way that i i, I never was before and yeah. uh and i and I, I would love to, to to help you to to sort of bring the faithful back to back to the american camp yes th yeah awesome let's do that show soon hey i will make this slight correction i mean I, I love everything you said and let's do this show soon though the one you just suggested sure but i am a kind of an integralist right i'm a first sure. amendment integralist which sure. is to say um, a lot of people make this mistake, literally the first amendment, no tricks, no deep research necessary, just a little research stands for the proposition that the States could and should, I've been distinguishing between could and should a lot the last two weeks, but here they're aligned could and mm -hmm. should the States could and should the 13 original States, 50 States now have their own establishment state establishment of one of the sects of Christianity depending on what's popular in the state, just the Congress can't do that, right? right? That's what they stood for. And it was the evil 14th Amendment, the same evil 14th Amendment that forced porn, contraception, sodomy, gay marriage, and abortion on the states, made it illegal for them to make it illegal. The 14th Amendment did. Same exact amendment or jurisprudence of the 14th Amendment made it illegal for the individual states to have their own official state sect of Christianity. And eight of the original 13 states did. So I am an integralist in that sense, just no national As religion. My. Our real republic is our state. I'm a state's rights guy, but I'm much more yes. of an integralist than, than a lot of my, my, my people think. And I do, I do talk about chapter nine, the reactionary American. I do talk about the, uh, because I mean, this New Hampshire, my, the great state of New Hampshire, my home um, was the last colony or the last state to abolish its established church the congregational church congregationalism was the official religion of new hampshire until well after the civil war um so i guess when i meant that i'm not an integralist anymore i'm not i i, I meant that uh that I'm, I'm not someone who believes that the american republic was badly founded i actually it seems to me like the, the american republic was very very well founded especially considering the alternative models that were coming out of france and italy at the time so Right. Yeah, there's, uh, there's that. That is that. That is something that I myself have become very, very passionate about, and also very concerned about. So I would, I would love to, I would love to help you make, you know, spread that message. However, however, I can. Yeah, people are allergic to it. Let's do that show within yeah. a month, um, and sure. we'll we'll also talk about Pius the Ninth and guys like Jefferson Davis and why they're better champions of the original vision of America than I don't know Lincoln. Sure. But we, we, I, we will we will save that. We'll table it as I they say, that. until that show. All right. So people go buy this book. I'm not joking. The Reactionary Mind, Why Conservative Isn't Enough. It's just the perfect title and subtitle for late 2021 when the sky is falling. 
Michael, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for everything you've done. And you will be back on the show in Let's Make It Three Weeks. People, I'm going to Franciscan to give a big talk at 8 p.m. on November the 3rd, shortly after the end of the hollow tide. So I'll be there next week, next Wednesday. And it's going to be a big talk. It'll be in support of my feminism book, but you can ask me anything. I don't know. I'll be uh, uh, there the second and the third and visiting with some friends in Franciscan, including Matt Frad and others. If you, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I like to check out the basketball gym, maybe playing some one-on-one at Franciscan. I don't even know if they have a gym, but when I go to colleges, I like to play uh, in their gym. So that'll be that. But after I get back, Michael Warren Davis will be back on. Thank you for coming with me today. God bless you all. Deus Volt, as they said in the Crusades, Deus Volt people. God bless you.